So welcome. I thought I'd start off today by telling you a little bit about TED. TED started off 30 years ago. At the time, it was a small, shrouded conference that happened in Southern California. What happened in the room basically stayed in the room. In 2002, Chris Anderson took it over, and he turned it from a for-profit conference to a non-for-profit conference whose underlying mission was ideas worth spreading. So in 2007, we decided to take these lectures, these 18-minute lectures that were happening at our conference and put them online for free. And at that time, it was a pretty bold move because we didn't really know what would happen. Would we alienate our core conference audience? And would anybody really show up to watch an 18-minute lecture online? This was before the proliferation of video. And um, we weren't sure. And at the beginning, actually, not that many people did show up. But um, we started getting emails like this. I'm sitting at my desk at work, tears running down my face, watching Majora Carter's presentation and thinking, I love this woman. And so we realized people were connecting to these videos in a very personal way. And so nearly seven years later, we have 1,500 TED Talks. This doesn't include the TEDx Talks, which we have another 30,000. And the TED Talks have seen, been seen over one billion times. Um, and their underlying goal is just to spread good ideas around the world. And so the next thing we took on was that these talks were pretty much um, only in English. And so we started to think about, well, how could we make the talks accessible in other languages? And we launched the Open Translation Program, which is a volunteer program where volunteers translate the TED Talks. Um, we have nearly 10,000 volunteer translators working in 102 different languages. And they've done about 45,000 or over 45,000 translations. And so the talks were getting out there into the world in multiple languages, the brand was growing, and more and more people kept coming to TED and saying, we'd love to have a TED conference in our city or our country. And at the time, we were a tiny team of about 25 to 30 people. And so scaling a big conference around the world wasn't really a practical solution. So we sat down to try to figure out what we could do to solve this problem. Um, and so Chris and I spent a summer thinking about this, and that at, at the end of the, we came up with this idea of open sourcing TED in what is now known as TEDx. And um, I spent that summer writing some basic rules and guidelines. And in March 2009, we hosted our first TEDx event. It was um, on the University of Southern California's campus. And really, it was just an experiment. We thought maybe you know, one or two other people would actually host a TEDx event after that. Um, this March is our five-year anniversary, and we've had about 8,896 TEDx events all over the world. They've been held, thank you, they've been, <laughs> they've been held and planned in 161 different countries, 50 languages, and we estimate about 1.5 million people have actually attended TEDx events in different countries. We've had TEDx events in shanty communities like TEDx Mathari. In fact, we have a whole series of TEDx events in Kenya. The Gates Foundation hosted a TEDx event in TEDx Kibera. Uh, we've had it in Clip Town in South Africa. We've had TEDx events on a floating hotel in the middle of an Amazon forest for 600 people to talk about sustainability. It was a remarkable event. This TEDx event was one of the first TEDx events that happened in Pakistan on an all-women's campus, and for the first time, they allowed a co-ed event to take place. And we've had several other TEDx events on this campus since. Um, we've had about 1,083 university events, with another 258 planned. We've had a TEDx event on the Great Wall of China. For the first time last year, we saw a series of TEDx events happening in correctional facilities um, around the world. And we've had TEDx events in Kabul, Tehran, Mogadishu, Baghdad, and the likes. And what's extraordinary about these TEDx events is we are here today and we take for granted we just organize this event. And that's not to belittle um, ISO and team have put a huge amount of work into this event today. But in environments like this, hosting a TEDx event takes a whole different set of challenges. Um, TEDx organizers have been threatened, their families have been threatened, permits are hard to get, TEDx events have been shut down. When the TEDx event actually does happen, it is absolutely extraordinary for the community because it gives them a safe place to talk about ideas and to be innovative and to take action. And it creates a space in these communities that they didn't generally have. Um, and so I wanted to share this quick quote that sort of epitomizes this. I'm sitting at the end of the world, the nearest small town over 600 kilometers away, huge oil fields surrounded by massive dunes, nothing else, with the head of the world's largest oil company and his hotshot team. 
co-ed. And what has most impacted these young Saudis in the past few weeks, not Japan or the turmoil next door, but TEDx Rehard and Jeddah. It's what everyone is talking about. It's the leading topic on Twitter and Facebook. In a place that is rapidly opening up, you are leading. And so it is this extraordinary community of TEDx organizers around the world. And they all believe deeply in the power of ideas to change the world. Um, and they share this common DNA, and I say this often, they, I feel they often have more in common with each other than they sometimes do with their next door neighbor or a relative down the road. They believe deeply in collaboration versus competition. They hold workshops and other events all over the world. They believe in the cross-cultural exchange of ideas. Many TEDx events, like this TEDx event today, live streams out to the broader community. This was TEDx Ramallah that live streamed into Israel and four other um, countries, um, Arab countries. Um, and they truly believe in this community of people um, and the possibility of a global community of people who respect other people's ideas and culture. And they embrace this model of radical openness. And so I wanted to play this quick video that really gives you a sense of who these extraordinary people are and who are organizing these TEDx events all over the world. We had no idea what this would become. We really wanted to focus on turning ideas into action and how democratization of innovation is really enabling anyone to take part in turning those ideas into action. For TEDx Ohio State University, they live streamed our event into the prison on the one computer that had internet. They put it onto the wall, and inmates sat around and they watched it. And then the inmates said, we can do this. The men planned this event. We had 17 speakers and performers, all speaking on social justice in the incarceration system. Half of them were inmates, half of them were outside guests. The day was based off of this concept that this is a place to grow and to learn and to challenge yourself. I look upon busloads of school children being driven towards dreams thought to be unattainable sights and sounds of the ghetto. I wanted to take TEDx to a school in the slum called Farik Ramas. I really wanted to have TEDx be a tool by which the kids actually learn to do everything themselves, from designing the stage to approving the speakers. It was very empowering. That spirit is what I wanted the kids to learn. For me, TEDx is about amplifying the impact of others. We had a speaker named Ken Fernandez Prada, and he actually escaped Colombia as a child, and his dream was to work for a healthcare company like Johnson & Johnson so that he could help improve healthcare conditions back in his home. We gave him the opportunity to present on the tedx &J stage, and he talked about this telemedicine idea that he had. Well, based on that event, he connected with someone in one of our orthoclinical businesses, and they're now actually doing that project in Colombia. In the last event, one of my speakers was chosen to be on TED.com. He's a graphic designer that created this project called Israel Loves Iran, and it went totally viral. Iranians created a group called Iran Loves Israel, and there was Palestine Loves Israel, and Israel Loves Palestine, and Germany Loves Palestine, and it just blew up to give a platform for this guy's message was something really phenomenal. Shamila Kohistani, she had the courage to start the first women's soccer team in Afghanistan. I wanted to show the world the other side of Afghanistan, the brave women of Afghanistan who are making history despite the challenges that they are facing in daily life. After TEDx Women, she's now working at the UN, advocating for girls just like her all around the world. Ayo Tillett, who gave a really shocking and surprising talk on transgender, connected with a young Afghan woman who was talking about going up under the Taliban and established a girls' school. And she and Io connected at the TEDx Women Conference, and she invited her to come to Kabul to talk about transgender in a Kabul classroom of girls. The whole concept of that just explodes every possible boundary. TEDx is this, from the ground up, organization of people coming together to create more of the world that they want to live in. If I can look back 10 years and say, oh, that was because of TEDx, that would be a good contribution. Thank you. So being here today, you join this extraordinary group of women, I mean, people around the world who are committed to changing the world through ideas. And so I want to say, be brave, 
Um, be bold and stand up for what you believe in. And in closing, I just want to say a huge thank you. Um, so many TEDx organizers came together to organize this event today, so thank you, ISO and your team. I can't um, mention everybody by name, but thank you. <laughs>